Hello everyone. Today we are going to do lab 9, which is about resonance. Before getting to understand resonance, there is one concept that we need to know, and that is the concept of natural frequency. For all systems that oscillate, there has to be a natural frequency or natural frequencies of the oscillation. When you let a swing, swings without adding any force. The swing will have only one frequency. You cannot make it higher, you cannot make it lower. And that is the natural frequency of the swinging motion. Then, if we perturb the oscillation with a frequency that is the same as the natural frequency of the oscillation, the perturbation that we put in will reinforce the natural oscillation, making oscillation strong, and that is what we call resonance. We swing on a swing. We normally add some force to the swing at a right frequency, a natural frequency. Then the swing can keep swinging strongly. Try adding a force at a wrong frequency, a frequency that is not a natural frequency of the swing. You will see that the swing will not swing very far. That's because adding a force at a wrong frequency, the force will get chances to both reinforce and oppose the swinging motion. In this experiment, however, we are not using a swing to show a resonance of the swinging force that you put in and the swinging motion of a swing. Instead, we use sound, which is the oscillation of the flow and pressure of the air. Considering a tube with one end open, the air around the open end can move up and down while the air at the other end cannot move. This forces the sound wave in the tube to occur at certain wavelengths only. And the wavelengths are controlled by the length of the tube. If the length of the tube is one fourth of the wavelength of the sound, a standing wave of the sound can form. If the length of the tube is one fourth of the wavelength of the sound plus one half of the wavelength of the sound, a standing wave of the sound can form as well. Or if the length of the tube is increased by another half wavelength of the sound, in total equal to five fourths of the wavelength of the sound, a standing wave can also form. In these three cases, standing waves can form. Now, let's perturb the system by putting a speaker at the open end of the tube. When turned on, the speaker will move and will push the air to move as well. If we let the speaker move the air, or in other words, make sound at a right frequency, the sound will be noticeably louder than usual. This is because the frequency that we move the air by the speaker is the same as natural frequency of the tube, making the air in the tube move as well. In this experiment, what we change is the length of the tube. We have a speaker making sound at a frequency. We vary the length until we find certain lengths that allow resonance between the sound from the speaker and the sound from the tube. In the first part of the experiment, our goal is to find the sound speed. We use what we know on the left hand side of the board here to help find the sound speed. How? From this figure, if a tube of length L1 can make the first resonance with the sound from the speaker. Theoretically, the wave contained in that length L1 will be lambda over 4. In theory, we normally think that the place where the air has its maximum displacement of oscillation is right at the open end of the tube. In reality, it's not right at the open end of the tube. It's actually a little bit above the open end of the tube Therefore, we will add a correction epsilon into the equation. And so instead of L1 equal to lambda over 4, it will become L1 plus epsilon equal to lambda over 4. Then we rearrange the equation by moving epsilon to the right hand side of the equation. We can see that we have lambda in the equation. Now we link the wavelength lambda to the sound speed and the sound frequency V equal to F times lambda or lambda equal to V over L. So now 
L1 is equal to V over 4F minus epsilon. If we compare this with linear equation, taking L1 to be the variable Y and 1 over F to be the variable X, the slope is going to be V over 4. Slope is equal to the speed of sound divided by 4. Another thing that we see when taking L1 to be the variable y and 1 over f to be the variable x is that minus epsilon is the y-intercept of the graph. This is how we find the speed of sound using the linear relationship between L1 and 1 over f. What we do is we obtain data of L1 for each frequency. Let's change the frequency many times. Then we will get a data trend. Find a line that best represent our data. Then find the slope. We know the slope. We know the speed of sound. Another way to find sound speed is that we consider the difference between the length that allows the first resonance L1 and the length that allows the second resonance L2. The difference is equal to lambda over 2. L2 minus L1 equal to lambda over 2. Therefore, if we write the wavelength lambda in terms of the sound speed V and frequency F and rearrange the equation, we will finally get the sound speed V equal to 2 times F times delta L, which is the difference between L2 and L1. This is another way to find the speed of sound. We can use both ways. The first way is fine, the second way is also fine. After we get data, let's find the speed both ways and compare the results with the theoretical formula for the speed of sound here. Let's see if there will be any differences and see which one is more reliable. Well, actually, these three ways of finding the speed of sound shouldn't give us very different results. If the results differ a lot, there should be something wrong. The end of part one. Next, let's get to part two. In part two, we want to find the frequency of a source, a source that we didn't know what frequency it produces. We are given a tuning fork with an unknown frequency. And the tools that we are allowed to use are the same as what we used in part 1. So, are we going to find the frequency of the tuning fork? The key here is that it doesn't matter what sources are producing the sound. Let it be the speaker, let it be the tuning fork. It also doesn't matter what frequencies the source are producing. As long as the temperature of the air is the same, the speed of sound will be the same in all cases. In our case, the tuning fork and the speaker are producing sound in the same room, same setting. So the sound from both sources will have the same speed. We know that V equal to 2 times F times delta L. So we can say, the sound speed from source number 1 is equal to 2 times the frequency of the source number 1 times delta L from the experiment using source number 1. And the sound speed from source number 2 is equal to 2 times the frequency of the source number 2 times delta L from the experiment using source number 2. The ratio delta L2 to delta L1 obtained from the experimental data is equal to the ratio of F1 to F2. Assuming F1 is the frequency of the speaker, which is known, and F2 is the frequency of the tuning fork, which we want to find out. We just do the experiment and find the ratio of delta L2 to delta L1. Since the F1 is known, now we can find the frequency of the tuning fork F2, which was an unknown. And this is what we do for part 2 of this experiment. In this experiment, we want to vary the length of the tube. And the length of the tube is controlled by the water level below here. Um, so we control the level of the water by pulling up the bucket. When you pull up the bucket, the water level goes up. And then when you lower the bucket, the water level goes down. 
and this is how we vary the length of the tube. Another important part is what creates the sound and here we have function generator connected to the speaker. Um, with function generator we can adjust the frequency now is at 500 fre uh, hertz. We can change it to 600 hertz and to get the sound we push the button here. Yeah, We can change up and down This we change it to 700 hertz. Now we have control over the source and we can change the length of the tube. Next, let's see how it's going to be like when there is resonance between the sound produced by the speaker and the sound produced by the tube. Okay, we are going to use the frequency of 500 hertz. So the speaker now is producing a sound of 500 hertz. There's no resonance yet. Then we change the level of the water, I mean the length of the tube. And the loudness increase when the water level is at 15 centimeters. not that loud. So, so it's max at 15. Okay, so if the sound from the speaker has a frequency of 500 hertz, we are going to get uh, resonance when the water level is at 15 centimeter and 15 centimeter is the length of the tube measure from the open end to the water level and this is the first resonance okay and the 15 centimeter is taken to be L1 All right let's find the second resonance so we lower the level of water. Not yet, not yet. And getting loud. And the sound is fading. Let's go back up. Resonance occur at forty nine centimeters. All right, so we take forty nine centimeters to be L two. So at a specific frequency, we get L one and L two. Now let's change the frequency. So we can change it to six hundred, or we can change it to 700 hertz okay let's do this one so we can find l1 oh l1 is uh, probably about 10 centimeters so that's our l1 10 centimeters. Then let's find L2. Okay, we go down. Not 
Yeah. Hmm? We pass it. Let's go back up. It seems that the second resonance occurs at 35 centimeters. And that is our L2 for the frequencies of 700 hertz. So, yeah, we, we just have to do this for 500 hertz, 600 hertz, 700 hertz, 800, 900, and 1000 hertz. And that's all we do for part one. In part two, we do the same thing, but we, we don't use, uh, we are going to use uh, the tuning fork instead of speaker. Same, same thing. Just now, we have tuning fork as the source of the sound. seems L1 is probably about I think 16 centimeters mm. And then we can find L L two doing the same thing. And this is example of our data. We have to measure the radius of the tube, the inner the inner part of the tube. We have to measure the temperature of the room. And we measured L1 and L2 for each frequency. In part 2, actually the first line we used data from part 1. Just use data from part 1. What we have to do and get new data is just for the tuning fork. And from this data, we can find the frequency of the tuning fork. And this is all we do for lab 9 resonance.